Mm-hmm. Banter of truth. Y'all know what this is. This is the podcast where Jimmy and I just hang out and chop it up and talk about things. Uh, you know, things that we might not cover on the podcast normally, but um, Jimmy is not here. And don't freak out, everybody. I know you're all concerned. Like, J- Jimmy's not on the podcast. Listen, Jimmy just sometimes is working and he can't get here. He's been out of the country. And so we needed to record a banter of truth for you guys. We don't want to let you guys have hanging and we don't want you to not have this. You guys are supporters of the podcast and we want to give you good content, original content, commercial free content. And so uh, we're doing something different today. Uh, We're bringing on somebody that's been on the podcast a number of times. He's a friend of the podcast. We love him. I think you guys all know him well and love him. We have uh, Jordan the Maniac, Stefaniak, back on the pod. Jordan, what's up, man? Man, all sorts of things are up, including my ceiling. You know, I'll I'll do the old dad joke right there. But it's great to be back. It's good. Well, I know you got one of your kids in the room there hanging out. Like, he wants wants to be near dad. You're like, cool, lay there on the floor and be quiet. Don't say anything. No, you have no idea how many podcasts he's been a part of. <laughs> so he's a professional at being in the room while I podcast. I love it. I love it, man. Well, if you guys don't know who Jordan is, Jordan is the co-founder and president of the London Lyceum, where they get into analytic philosophy and confessional Reformed Baptist theology. You need to check it out. It's really, really good content. It's going to stretch you. It's it's not it's not easy. It's not easy stuff. Like this is this is challenging material that's really worth your time. Uh, smart dudes on there, and uh, so you go check it out. TheLondonLyceum.com. Go there, get all the stuff. There's a podcast. There's articles. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, you guys do goodness. You do these uh, call-ins where you have different theologians on there, roundtables and whatnot. So um, yeah, man, yeah, get in there and check it out. You, you guys will be you guys will be blessed for it. Jordan, what's going on, man? How's uh, how was your Sunday? My Sunday wasn't too bad. Um, you know, we've just been trying to get our house ready. So we just moved into a new house like a week and a oh, half, two weeks right. ago. That's so right. trying to get the office set up, which right now I feel like it looks decent. Um, so I've got one bookshelf in here. I need to remedy that because the rest of my books are sitting in the garage right. uh, mm-hmm. without a home. And it's, you know, you always find yourself, if you pack up any books, you know that the book you need is going to be packed away the last second. Yeah. Um, because so I've got all the books that I probably need sitting out there, but I've tried to get the mainstays on this shelf that I've got in here. So, you know, you've got um, Big Daddy Herm Dog, uh, which, you know, Herman Bobbink, um, John Calvin. Who else do I have? I've got Turretin on the back shelf. So I've got the mainstays, the people that I reference the most. Maybe, and uh, of course. Maybe some John Yes, Gill. Yes, I, I mean, we're remedying that. So I want to have beautiful volumes yeah. of John Gill. Yeah, not these old busted, cracked books that, you know – that have been laying around forever. I don't even know if they're still in print. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get all into it. Um, you know, my Sunday was good. Uh, worship was great. You know, I loved preaching. The worship was, you know, singing was good. Everything was great. Um, but uh, somebody ran over my mailbox and uh, it broke. And so... Hold on. Somebody... Who was this? Do you know who the somebody was? Mm, you know, I, pro- I I do. I do know who it was. Um, the, the important thing is that, uh, <laughs> I was like, great. I haven't, you know, had to dig post holes in uh, years, but, and we don't have a post hole digger anymore. So I went to Lowe's, I did the whole thing and then I wound up getting the wrong mailbox. And so, um, it's throwing off, uh, it's throwing off my day today. Cause I'm going to have to figure out, cause there's no mail running today. It's a holiday. We need to have it up by tomorrow. So what, what's the holiday? What, what is today? I don't know. It's some holiday. My kids are off school. Is it the so I remember when I lived in Illinois because I grew up in Illinois. Yeah. Um, what there's like a Casimir Pulaski Day. Is that what this is? No, no, no. It's just like a okay. nice holiday. Let's see what is it. This is a legit day. holiday. Oh, it's uh it's Columbus Day. Is it? Yeah. Columbus I didn't even day. know schools still were out for that. Oh, uh, up here we do. Oh yeah. Oh, but I thought. It, it was but it's bad. also Indigenous Peoples Day. So okay. You know, it's it's both. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> so man, I've been uh, yeah. I, I had this whole new plan for today that I was going to, I had this whole new schedule. I was so excited to get into it. And, uh, and then this thing is interrupting my day. It's changing every, as I have, cause I, I, I don't have time. I got a lot, it goes late. I have elders meetings tonight. So I have to uh, cut some things out of my schedule. It's been, it's been annoying. I've been, I got a little baby about it at first complaining like, Oh, well, you know, I guess I won't get anything done like a little baby. And then, uh, you know, I sucked it up, repented, and uh, 
got busy and we'll, we'll get everything I can done. But I'm so glad that we have time to chat, man. Um, really have been uh, looking forward to talk to you about this because when, uh, when I was in college, I was reading all kinds of stuff, right? I was reading all this material from my school, Moody Bible Institute, a uh, good evangelical school, but dispensational, and I wound up disagreeing with them so much, I was always reading outside of class. I had tons of library books in my room, in, in addition to my own growing library, and um, I, I picked up, I don't even know how I got it. I got a hold of this book by John Gill, um, and I, th I think it was, is, is Body of Divinity, but I, it was a different, it was in two volumes, in, whereas this is, you know, I think this is the body of divinity. It's a uh, doctrinal and practical, but I think they had divided it into two. Anyways, they, um, I, and I was like, who is this? What is this? And I looked him up and was shocked to see like, whoa, okay, this guy, uh, 18th century reformed Baptist guy, Hebrew scholar. And I loved what I was reading. So I read as much of him as I could when I was in college. And then later on, I got this, uh, this printed uh, edition of um, his body of doctrinal and practical divinity. So we wanted to bring you on because uh, you guys have launched the John Gill Project. And I want to talk to you about John Gill, who he was, why he was important, why he is important today, and then what the John Gill Project is doing, how we can support it, and what it's going to do for all of us. Sweet, man. So I love Gill uh, for a lot of reasons. But I would say one of the biggest reasons is because he is a true pastor theologian. Mm. So oftentimes today you get that th term thrown around, you want to be pastor theologians. And I think it helps to, rather than keeping that sort of abstract, what in the world is a pastor theologian actually supposed to do or look like? You hold up models and examples and say, that's what it looks like. This isn't the perfect example you know, for every situation, for every context. But if you can get five or six different sort of models to say, these people exemplified it well, you can take the things that fit your own local context and utilize them and begin to serve your congregation thanks to it. So he's a pastor first and foremost, Gil. Uh, oftentimes when you think high-powered theology, you think people that are in the academic mm -hmm. institutions that are writing the big books there. And it wasn't like that for Gil. Gil was first and foremost a pastor. Everything he wrote was feeding his own flock. It was just a fruit of his own pastoral teaching ministry, of defending the faith against all sorts of various heresies and errors. So I, I love the fact that Gill is primarily a pastor. And then secondarily, he is a theologian. So when you come to the Baptist, uh, you know, I guess, Mount Rushmore of theologians, Gill's got to be on that. So he may be the top one. I think he probably is. But if not, he's, he's on that Mount Rushmore of Baptist theologians. Mm. So I love that about him. As you think about Gill and placing him in context, Remember, he born 1697, dies 1771, and that is like sort of the tail end of the more agrarian traditional sort of society because you have the Industrial Revolution in 1760, and that right at the end of his, end of his life is going to revolutionize everything. Remember, American Revolution happens 1765-ish, that begins. So think of those contexts. These things are radically changing the world there at the tail end of his life when these books and things are being published. So it's radical shift and upheaval that's ongoing. And Gill is a part of preserving strong, healthy, sound doctrine across the board. So I love Gill and I love what we're doing here. We're trying to republish it. So you've got that volume there, that big, massive one. I've got that same one mm -hmm. uh, from, what is it, the Baptist Standard Bearer or something like that. So glad that they did this, but we want Gill to be accessible, number one, to local churches, so we want people in churches to actually use it and have it as a resource. And we want it to be available in contexts that pastors are more likely to grab it. So to serve the lay people and to republicize his work in that way, we're taking sort of snippets from different areas of Gill and making smaller volumes. So like the first volume that's going to come out in this series is called What is Theology? And it's just the preface to his body of doctrinal divinity. So if you look in that book you've got there, that preface, we pull it out and we're going to put it in one volume. And we have Jonathan Swan, who Michael Haken thinks is like the greatest Gill scholar we've got uh, living today. And he writes an introduction. He's going to write an introduction to this, which I have it right here in front of me, as well as like a little brief intro to what this, this volume. Cool. So you've got like a 18 pages on who is Gill, what's, it, what is about, what's his life look like, why is he important today? And then you have this prolegomena that's going on to his theology. And it covers topics like, the systematic nature of theology, how we, sh how we should interpret doctrine, 
how should, we should understand the word theology, natural theology, supernatural theology, uh, you know, the glory of Christ in theology, and the reformation of theology. So he's covering what is typically, if you buy Turretin, you've got this big prolegomenous, right. prolegomenous section, 200 pages or whatever. This is basically 100 pages in Gill's uh, version of what he's doing. So I think this is going to be a tremendous resource for churches because he writes it not for the academic institutions, but for the local church. Yeah. So I really believe this is something you would take churches through. But we also want to do the more serious, high-powered pastors. You need to have all three volumes on your shelf sort of thing. So I hope towards the end of the project, have Body of Practical Divinity and Body of Divinity in mid... I'm not sure how many volumes it'll be. In that volume you've got there, it's one. That's yeah. too much, I think, to have nice typesetting. But right. Stephen Charnock, just, they just did that with Crossway, yep. where it's two volumes, Existence and Attributes of God. Yep. You look at that, the typesetting looks awesome. Yeah. The footnotes, they've done a ton of work to chase the footnotes. And then Mark Jones basically just modernized some of the older language yeah. so we could understand it. And that's really the goal that's that awesome. we'll have with that towards the end. So you can have Gill next to your other theologians and say, I don't just have Presbyterians. I also have my serious Baptist who, what is it? I think Richard Muller calls him, I mean, he calls him part of the Reformed Orthodox. I know Martin Lloyd-Jones, I've got this sweet quote from him. He says, Gill, as a man, not he's not only of great importance in his own century, but a man who is still of great importance to all of us. Mm. I mean, Martin Lloyd-Jones, if he says that, you've got to believe it. So love Gill. Yeah. And yeah, we've got this awesome project. So let's, let's chat about it. Well, Gil, you know, when I started reading him, and, you know, this was before you could do really quick research through the internet, you know, um, this would have been like 94 when I started reading Gil. Um, I didn't have a computer, you know, I had to go to the computer lab to type my papers. And, um, and so I was reading up on Gil and then finding stuff and, you know, going deeper. And I was like, this guy's written a, a complete commentary on every book of the Bible, and I still use Gill to this day. I mean, his his commentary is good. It's helpful, I, I, and you can get it for free online. You can just, you know, look it up. It's online in a bunch of places. But I remember just really enjoying his, his concise, on-target exposition of passages. Uh, he did the whole Bible, and then he wrote his, if I'm not mistaken, he, he wrote his Body of Divinity, which I think, it, you know, it doesn't have to be done that way, of course, but boy, it feels good to know this guy who <laughs> did a commentary on every book of the Bible, and then he got to work writing uh, his stuff, The Cause of God and Truth and, and everything else. Yeah. So I think I, that's a good point about the ordering of how you know stuff, because that oftentimes can get twisted a little bit, yeah. where we do want to be exegetically grounded. Uh, to really inform us as we do our theology. So I think that's a good practice. It's not necessary, like you said, but I right. think that's a healthy practice. Yeah, it feels right. You know, it feels right. like, okay, you've really done the work in, in all the Scripture, now here's the fruit of it. Um, whereas, you know, Calvin's commentary is in, incomplete, you know, were done over, over years and, you know, didn't precede, of course, um, his work on the Institutes, which are amazing. I love the Institutes. I don't have... You know, I'm not, I'm not calling out Calvin. I don't want to fight with Calvin. Um, but I also love that, you know, Gill's going through such tremendous societal cultural shifts and changes. And he's just locked in. Like, he knows what he's about. And he, he was instrumental in, in the, in the fight for independence. I know he was involved in, in that stuff. He wasn't politically aloof. But he, he certainly seemed to pour... The, the majority of his energy and his passion into the church, you know, into making disciples, into theology, the cause of God and truth. I, I, I was just, I love that because in our day where there is a lot of societal change, there's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of drama, it is easy for us, and I'm sure it was just as easy back then, to get sidetracked and to get, to almost despair as if, wow, with all of these changes and all of this going on, who knows what's going to happen? You know, is this the end of the church? Is this the great threat of the church? I just love that he just locked in. Now, I wanted to yeah. ask you if, if you could, you know, maybe you could f fill me in on this. My reading of Gill, not, I mean, I've read him, but my reading about him from others seemed to suggest that, like, in his day, he was the man when it came to Hebrew. Like, he was, like, the scholar of his day. It, it, is that fair or is, is that an Yeah, I think 
I think that's fair. And it's a little bit shocking when you think about his own context. So he is being educated in all these sort of things until I think about he's like 11 or 12 when basically, I don't know what that, the term is they use back then, schoolmaster or whoever, whoever their teacher is, decides he's going to take the class to like, um, you know, Church of England sort of thing uh, to for daily reading sort of stuff. And his parents do not like that. They're part of a dissenting group. Um, they do not want to be about part of the, the formal Church of England in any, sen- in any sense. So they don't, they don't want to support that. So they pull him out of out of school. And I mean, he's he's one of the, br- the brightest students, clearly. And they, despite trying to continue their education, at the age of 12, he's not being formally educated anymore. Mm. He's working with his dad, uh, doing like a, a manual labor sort of, I don't remember what he does, some sort of role with his dad until he's like 19. So for like seven years, he has no formal education whatsoever. Um, yet he continues to read and learn and study so much so that he is given an honorary doctorate from the University of Aberdeen. So he is clearly uh, an incredibly bright uh, individual and is just self-motivated to the nth degree. So he, I mean, he continues to learn Greek and Hebrew and Latin and he is, he is a legit linguist. So he knows what he's talking about. If you read his stuff, I mean, if you chase his footnotes, it's insane the amount of Hebrew that's involved in there. So I know we've got a guy who's working on, who's been tra- transcribing uh, his work on the Trinity, and he's been working on it for years because of all the Hebrew that's involved in it and all the complexities that goes on it. But that unless you're a scholar of that, of that, right. it's incredibly difficult uh, to do the necessary work to bring it back to today. So yeah. he is absolutely a, a serious scholar of Hebrew and Greek and Latin. I can imagine as challenging as it is to read, to edit Gill, and, uh, you know, so, so you can present it again in the 21st century would be Herculean. Like that's a, yeah. That's a so a lot of people, I don't know if they understand all that goes in, on into these sort of things. Anybody could theoretically go and grab a PDF copy of a lot of Gill stuff and just put it into a book. Yeah. But there are so many aspects of it that you've got to chase to make sure that you're putting in accurately. Mm-hmm. There's, words and phrases that might need to be updated. There are footnotes that you have no idea, sources that you don't know where they go, where they've been. You have to know a whole heck of a lot in order to do it the right way. So there's, you can cut corners and make it available just as it is. But if you want to do it the right way and preserve it as he intended, it, it is a lot of work that goes into it. Even if you're just like copying for the majority part, what he said, sure. there's a lot of work that goes in uh, beyond that. Well, just typesetting alone is like, this is something that Crossway does very, very well with their Bibles and everything else um, is like, you know, when I'm, when I pick up you know, a lot of these old volumes, you know, it's minuscule print double column. If you have, if you're watching on video, you can see. So, I mean, it's, it's not easy on the eyes. And I know people are like, Oh, poor you. Like, well, if you're reading for two hours or three hours, yeah, you're, you're going to read slower. It's going to be more laborious. Yeah. So like, you know, even to, you know, t- paying attention to typesetting, um, you know, margins, uh, orphans and widows with the, you know, with how things are working and, yeah. and the way they're laying out uh, all, there's so much that goes into it that people have no idea about, but it makes a huge difference in whether or not people are going to, you know, find it as accessible as we want them to. If you want pastors to grab this off the shelf versus something else, it needs to look the part. Yeah. And if you want your church members to read it and not just pretend to read it, it needs to be in ways that they look at it and they say, I'm not intimidated by this. Mm. If you pull that off the shelf and show it to them, they will be intimidated. Yeah. So I think it's important to have these sort of stylistic things that go into it. Yeah. While it may seem, you know, sort of like, well, that's not theological. Actually, I do think it partly is theological if you want to be serious about that. Um, but it is very important to have those things nailed down. Yeah. Well, you know, there's like, there's the nerd, right? Like, you know, like I, I see a book like that and I'm like, give me that, give me that book. I want that book. I want that giant book with minuscule print. Like I can geek out about it on that level, but I also know my, myself well enough to know it, it's going to be easier to read if it's packaged differently. Well, like Gurnall, you know, I read Gurnall's um, the true bounds of Christian freedom in the in the one volume banner of truth minuscule print thing, um, but they have an, a, a a three volume edition of that that has updated language in it. That's that's much easier. That you know that I I probably would have 
had a, a better, a quicker time with. Um, so I'm excited about that you're doing this. What is something about Gil that stands out to you personally? Like when you read Gil, when you, what you have read, what, what is something that you love about his theology? And then what is something that you don't like about his theology? Yeah, I like, I mean, well, I guess I don't want to just say love or like, I, I need to say love, right? So yeah, what do you I love? love, I love Gil's succinctness and orthodoxy with traditional doctrines. He doesn't try to do new and different things. He tries to just stay in the steady stream of orthodoxy, which you don't always find particularly in his period. He's one mm -hmm. of the only ones standing resolutely in the stream of orthodoxy against uh, various heretical and, and, I mean, I guess not heretical, heterodox, if that's the right term for it, where it's it's sort it's not the level of heresy, but it's it's not also sure. traditionally orthodox doctrine. I know some people, I know Michael Haken has pushed back against th that usage of heterodoxy, but I'm going to use it in the colloquial sense that everybody understands, not in the super nerdy scholarly sense, whatever that means. So I think he's doing great work there, and he says it succinctly. So if you read his stuff, he's not like this overly verbose, going to take 100 pages to delineate every possible sense of it, which I like that too. But I also like just the, the conciseness of being able to say these orthodox things, give the important aspects of it, and then move on to the next thing because it really does help uh, a lot of people in those ways. Another thing that I love about him is just his pastoral context. I really do love that he's not trying to build a platform. He's not trying to publish things to build his name. He is being published because he's being goaded by people to do it. This is first and foremost for his local church. And I think that context of doing theology is the right context of true theology. When it's divorced from the church, it may still be right, but there's something off about it. Right. There's something that's missing. It's missing its ultimate end goal of service to the church. And I don't think that's missing at all with Gil. I think it's present there. So I love the fact that he's doing that. And it shows. I mean, he's doing commentaries. I hope to see his commentary on the Song of Solomon eventually republished with us because I think that's one of the most impactful and useful works that he has give, done, but it, it requires an insane mm. amount of work. I am not equipped to do it because of all the Hebrew. Like it's just, I took my two semesters and I'm done with Hebrew, moved on. So I have no ability to work on that piece, but I know there are other people who have the skills required for it, but it requires a special person because you have to know Hebrew. Yeah. You have to be interested in old dead guys and you have to know your theology really well. Right. So there's like this, particular skill set that's required for for volumes like that. So I love that about Gil. I mean, I think of him as, you know, Thomas Goodwin, John Owen, sort of contemporaries. He's the Baptist one, the heavyweight that come, that should come to mind for us and shouldn't be left off the table. As far as something I don't like, uh, I mean, obviously everybody's going to push back on his, I think most people push back on his eternal justification piece where he says you're justified from eternity. I get the rationale, so I don't hate it as much. I do hate the implications that come from it because it oftentimes does lead to sort of a hyper-Calvinism where I don't need to share the gospel because it is what it is. It's already been determined from eternity. So I don't like that at all. Uh, and Gil, I don't think, is a hyper-Calvinist because he does protect the free offer of the gospel and say you should offer the gospel to all people. But you know, the way it goes, people grab hold of your stuff and two, three generations later, it, it devolves into to bad news. So I don't yeah. love that about him. Uh, the doctrine itself, I don't think is like super damaging. I can understand why he's doing it, but the practical, people aren't as smart as Gil are going to take that and lead right. it to the wrong conclusion. Yeah. So I don't like that about, about Gil. And, but other than that, I mean, it's it's maybe I don't like that he smiled or don't like that he didn't smile as much because I do feel like you should be happy and joyful. But the, con I mean, his period, no one freaking smiles. You look at all the pictures, none of them are smiling. So I'm sure he was happy in real life. I don't know. Yeah, we changed uh, we changed RBF to Resting Baptist Face years ago. I made a little meme for it. It just put up Baptist <laughs> theologians because that's RBF. Uh, we we beat it before it was a thing <laughs> in the 21st century. So why why has Gill been so largely overlooked and forgotten by so many? Um, you know, he's got a commentary that is wonderful. It's accessible. It's I mean, I recommend it to everybody in my church. They've got uh, yeah, obviously he's got he's got you know his works as well. Um, so when, it's, when when we don't have a lot of heavy hitters 
that are held up. Like, you know, if you're real Baptist, if you're, if you're reformed Baptist, then you know, you know, Kiffin and Keach and all these guys, but why does, why has Gil been so overlooked by so many for so long? Well, you know, in his own time, he was, he was well known and his works were published widely. They were, they were sent across the Atlantic to America and he was very influential. And people thought of him sort of as the spokesperson and the figurehead behind the Calvinistic dissent movement in general for Baptists. Uh, so he, he was very well known. But then I do think um, the degeneration of Calvinistic orthodoxy into hyper-Calvinism had a detrimental effect to his legacy, to where he gets attached to that. Mm-hmm. And therefore, those who don't appreciate and don't like that I mean, hyper-Calvinism, obviously, I don't like hyper-Calvinism either, right. but his name gets attached to it, and so do his works. So over time, the usage of those volumes goes down because he's associated with that. And that, I think, was the primary factor in losing uh, the importance and prom- prominent place of Gill's works, of Gill's thought. I do mm-hmm. think that has shifted and changed, probably in large me- measure to people like, due to people like Tom Nettles. Yeah. who have tirelessly worked to to revitalize Baptist sources like Gill, mm-hmm. Michael Haken, and other people. I mean, Michael Haken's on the board of the, the Gill Project, so clearly he loves Gill, despite Haken says he he thinks Gill was a hyper-Calvinist. Well, he, uh, he doesn't. We're, 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 we're got, Haken's coming on, so... Uh... Well, I'm I'm pumped to hear what he says because I know he he defends that even and yet he still looks at Gill and says Gill is a resource that we need as Baptists that we need as Christians. He's good not just for Baptists but for everybody yeah, yeah. in in the Christian tradition, uh, particularly naturally those in the Reformed tradition, and whatever people want to say about Reformed, what that means. Richard Muller is if he says somebody's Reformed, he's Reformed, yeah. and he he looks at Gill and says, yeah. He gets the stamp of TM reformed yeah. uh, approval. So he's part of the reform movement and is so, necessary and useful. So it sounds like one of the main reasons you think that he was, he's been sort of overlooked is because he became associated with uh, hyper Calvinism. And that was more of it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like in my recollection of church history, that hyper Calvinism, hyper Calvinism was a bigger thing in England uh, than it was uh, over here in North America. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I that's think right. So. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a historian either, so I'm sure some nerd historian who's listening. Well, correct us if we're give... wrong guys. Cause like we don't, but I, that's, that's my sense. It seemed like there was a lot more going on in England with it. Um, well, and so, yeah, so, so he, if he's getting lumped in with them, uh, so he, it's almost as if he's kind of, kind of got blacklisted, you know, uh, historically because... He got canceled. Uh, yeah, he, got, he was canceled. Or like, oh, yeah, we saw this thing you said about eternal justification. There's no coming back from that. Um, good, good. Okay, cool. So, so w- tell us about this John Gill project again. Um, so you, just summarize, what is it? Yeah. When can we expect the first volume? And how can people help support it? So again, the project is just fundamentally, we want to republish and republicize the works of Gill. So part of republishing it is making it in nice, good looking, awesome fonts and typesetting. So it's appealing to people, but also we want to do the hard work of making sure it's accurate. But then we want to like market it to people and say, Gill is a resource worth using. So here are the volumes. So we're trying to republish, I don't know, probably a total of like 20-ish volumes for the, the length of the project. So you're on the, if you're watching the YouTube or whatever, you can see here, he's on our website, the LondonLyceum.com. If you're not, I'll just explain it to you. There's a resource tab up the top. You hover the, over that, boom, John Gill Project's the second thing. You click it, it's gonna give you all the details. You know, what, what is the project? Uh, why form the project? What volumes do we plan to publish? So we're planning to publish um, segments of different parts of his work, like, you know, his work on the Trinity, his work on the divine attributes, his work on the covenants, his work on public uh, worship, those sort of things. We'll do individual volumes that are, I mean, divine attributes is probably gonna be like 300 pages. So it's not like, it's not like a small volume. That'll be a hefty, serious volume. But then you can use that for your own churches for teaching through different doctrines and not have to require people to buy 2000 pages and say, here, read this section because that intimidates people. So we're going to do that, but we're also going to do a modernized cause of God and truth. 
uh, we're going to do some selected sermons, some of which have never been published. So there's sermons that are sitting over at Duke University right now, handwritten. No one's ever published them. So I, I live right next to Duke, so I can drive over, That's take great. some pictures, and, and we can make that a, a reality, as well as we do plan to do a full three. Right now, it's going to be three-volume unabridged set of the body of divinity and, and practical divinity because we think that matters and that's important. But that's sort of at the end of the project. We're going to do bits and pieces as we go. We expect to have this first volume, which we mentioned. I mentioned earlier. We're going to call it, it's his introduction to theology. We're calling it "What Is Theology," and that should be here by the end of the year. We're hoping to have it here before Christmas time, so you'll be able to go buy it as a Christmas present nice. for your theology nerd friend and use it for your churches next year. And then we do have, we're working on an, sort of an abridged one volume of his body of divinity and body of practical divinity that's going to be selections of that that we think are key to, to Gil's thought so that you can use that in your churches as well. So that'll be like, let's just cover the main areas. Because, you know, he, sometimes he gets on, droning on about stuff that you're like, this isn't right. super relevant. This was relevant to his own context, but to our context, it's not. So we'll, right. we'll basically just like, we're not going to transcribe that part. We're going to put in the stuff that's really important into a one volume abridged version. It's not going to lose Gil's actual, we're not like changing all of what Gil said. It's just going to be, we're going to be removing sections that we find as not as valuable. Right. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. Hope to have everything done by the end of 2026, but we're going to start releasing volumes at the end, one volume at the end of this year, as well as a couple are slated for next year. So you'll be seeing several volumes every year come out. And as far as supporting it, I mean, we need people to publicize it, obviously. We need people to tell your friends about it, tell your, your pastor friends about it, but we do need financial support for it. So big publishers aren't interested in Gil. Let's just be clear. They're not because they look at the bottom line and say, Gil's not profitable. Right. So you have to go with publishers who are serious about, we don't care about the bottom line. We care about getting good resources into people's hands. So when we talk to Michael Haken about it, he says, let's do it with H&E Publishing because they're serious about that. They'll do a good job with the typesetting, the font, all that sort of stuff. But they also don't care how many copies it sells. They're interested in getting good resources into people's hands. So we're doing this with H&E Publishing, who I think is a tremendous publisher. They're great to work with and they're going to do a great job. But we need sort of finances to front that because they aren't, they don't have a bank account like Crossway sitting there with however many millions of dollars in it to say, let's let's fund these sort of projects. So there's a lot of money that goes into the front end of building these out. So the people who are working on the transcription and stuff, we do that for free. But you have to pay people to do typesetting. Sure. You have to pay people to do cover designs. You have to pay people to do those things. And that does cost money. So we've estimated, me, Michael Haken, the editor at, at the, the publisher, that we'll need about $40,000 for the full project to be done. We've raised like 7,000-ish now. We're hoping to have about 15,000 by the end of next year to continue to fund the volumes that we have slated each year so that we can get them into people's hands. So either A, you're independently wealthy or not. I mean, mm -hmm. you give five bucks, that makes a difference. So don't, everything's so expensive now. Don't buy a Coke today, donate that money. That will support Gil being published and getting right. in your hands. Though there are a lot of you who are members or pastors at churches who have a budget for missions, who have a budget for these other things. I view this as a missionary endeavor to serve local churches. So maybe we get convince your church to get it on a line item on the budget and say, we want to give $500 to this project because we think it's valuable. It's going to serve our church. It's going to serve other churches in our community. We want to promote this. So I think, I mean, all it would take is a hundred churches to say, I want to give, you know, 200 bucks and then we're basically done. So it's not like you need to give a bunch of money to do this. We just need a lot of people to, to catch the vision and say, this is valuable. This is important. And we want to support this. So you can go donate at the website. Um, if you do donate a hundred dollars, you'll get that uh, abridged volume, uh, free of charge. We'll just send it to you when it's available. If you donate at least a thousand bucks, we'll send you every volume in the series. So, all 20, whatever we end up with, what you get? you'll get a copy of what every you, one. What do you get if you donate 5,000? If you donate, I don't know. Well, you, you gotta you have get something a, juicy like, a, like, I don't know, like a John Gill wig. Uh, <laughs> like, I want something special, man. I want, like, uh, I don't know. I, like, well, we'll have to think of, if someone wants to give $5,000, we'll have to think of something to, 
to make it special. Yeah. We'll get a signed yeah. autograph, Joe Thorne, oh, a picture you, of Joe Thorne. You just lost 5,000 bucks. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and, and, and anybody who might be interested in anything that I've written doesn't have $5,000, I think is a, yeah. is a general rule. Um, well, this is exciting, man. I, uh, I, I love the London Lyceum, and I, I really appreciate you as a, uh, as a friend, as a theologian, as a person who loves the church. And, you know, you guys are, you guys are heady. You're smart guys. You're, you're going into the deep waters, but you really do work to make sure that you're communicating in ways that people can understand. So I, I appreciate that, man. Appreciate you. Love the John Gill project. Uh, we're going to help promote it. And I can't wait because we're going to be buying up uh, some of those things ourselves uh, for us and, and for our people. So appreciate it, man. If people want to follow you on social media, how do they do that? Well, you just search my name in the social media tab. So go to Twitter. You can find me, JL Stefaniak. Uh, if you go to Facebook, you can probably find me. But if you friend me, I probably won't respond for like two weeks because I don't get on there all that much. Uh, just because I don't understand what all is going on in the Facebook world. But I like Twitter. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, um, you can follow us as well at Doc and Devo on Twitter or uh, Instagram. You know, the, the website, facebook.com slash doctrine and devotion and the website, doctrine and devotion.com. Now, listen, this is normally something that we give to our um, to our all access members. But uh, with uh, with Jordan coming on to talk about the John Gill Project, we wanted to share it with everybody. So everybody's getting this episode this week. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. And if you want to support Doctrine and Devotion, uh, scroll down on your little podcast player, look for the support this podcast. Boom, click that and you can become a member of all access and get our theological meditations and reflections uh, five days a week. We call that Weekday Wisdom or the Banter of Truth podcast, which drops every Tuesday. Thanks for listening. Jordan, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, man. Boom. All right, we got it. Sweet, dude. And that recording. And I can end this recording.